It's time for us to check back in with Alex Stewart and see what happens next in his life. If you missed the previous readings, please look in the description below for a playlist. In discussing the extremely poor living conditions of his childhood, Alex was sailing rapidly through one story after another when he mentioned something about a cabin not having a board or shingle roof on it. Now wait, Alex, I said, what do you mean about the cabin not having any boards? It was covered with bark, long dried pieces of peeled bark. This was an amazing revelation. I had never heard nor read of bark being used as a roofing material by any of the early settlers in America, other than the pilgrims, who presumably employed it as a temporary measure. But with Alex, dramatic surprises such as this were apt to occur at any time. Were you ever in any of these bark-covered cabins? Certainly. One house was right up here in the gap, and they wasn't a board on it. It was covered in bark. They'd put on that bark on there and put rib poles on the top of it to hold it down. They would drive wooden pins through the rib poles and through the bark and that would hold it in place. To make sure they held, they'd tie the ends of these rib poles down with strips of bark or sometimes with an old hand spun rope. Would the bark side be turned down on the house? No, the sap side would be turned down and the bark side turned up. It wouldn't leak a bit. Did the bark strips run up and down with the roof of the house? Yeah, they'd run up and down the house. They used chestnut bark and young like poplar. After poplars get so old, you can't peel it long enough. You can if you've got a spud, but you can't do it with just an axe. Poplar can be about a foot and a half in diameter, but any bigger than that, and they don't peel good. Old poplar, it gets heavy. I've seen pieces of bark peel off that I couldn't carry to save my life. It'll get two inches thick or thicker. They commenced peeling the bark when the tree started budding out good. These roofs wouldn't last very long, would they? They'll last right on. You see, it didn't have enough sap in it to hurt it. That's why they'd peel them early in the year before the sap got too high in it. It lasts several years. I've seen them make their lofts out of dried bark too. After it got good and dry, it would be as strong as a two by four. You could take a piece of that bark and make a good foot log to cross a branch or creek. I suppose that most of the cabins were just one room affairs. Oh yeah, and there's plenty of them that didn't have floor in them except the ground. Just that had dirt floor and it would be rounded down like the bottom of a bowl. The middle would get wore down before the sides and they wouldn't have a stick of furniture in them. They'd take a split out rail with a big rock under each end and use that to sit on and drive some big wood pegs in the wall to hang things on. They just had leaves and straw piled in the corner to sleep on. I've seen them that didn't have a sign of a table to eat off of. They'd maybe take a piece of dried bark and stick it in the cracks of the logs from one corner to another and use that as a sort of table. I seldom talked with Alex without learning something I considered exciting and historically significant. Late one night, after several hours of conversation, I was preparing to leave and noticed that the fire was getting low. I commented that we'd better add some more coal or wood to it or it would soon go out. Yeah, he said, if we let it go out, then we'll have to catch some more. The expression didn't sound right, and I had to think for a moment to understand Alex's meaning. To catch fire, as we understand it, means to be engulfed in flames. When a person or a building catches fire, they are being burned. But when the frontiersman struck a piece of flint stone with his knife, it caused a spark of fire, which he quite literally caught in a bunch of cotton. The spark ignited the cotton, which had a little gunpowder sprinkled on it. From this frontier term, our present day expression, catching fire, is doubtless derived. Back then, folks had to keep fire all summer if they wasn't fixed to catch it. I've seen Pat many a time take down his old powder horn and just get a pinch of powder. Then he'd take a little bunch of cotton, we always raised a little cotton, and he'd take his finger and wiggle out a little hole in that cotton. Then he'd put the powder in it and take his pocket knife and strike it on a little piece of flint rock. 
When he caught that first spark, he'd blow that cotton till it blazed up. Then he'd have some shavings to put on it, and pretty soon, he'd have plenty of fire. I've done that many times myself. That was before there were matches on Newman's Ridge. They wasn't no matches. I remember the first matches that come in our country. They'd stink worse than corn. Strike one and the smoke would catch you in the face and strangle you. George Bell got the first matches that I ever seed. He followed smoking all the time. He'd never use them unless he got down where there was a gathering of people. Then he'd pull out one of them matches and light his pipe. Everybody thought that was something. If a family didn't have matches, and if they weren't fixed to catch fire, then they'd have to keep their fire year-round. Yeah, they'd take and burn hickory, and it would make good coals. Then they'd cover them ashes with bark of a night, and the next morning there'd still be plenty of fire. But if you hadn't watched out, you'd let your gut fire go out, and then you either had to start one or go somewhere and bury some. We used to live close to George Bell. Well, before he got matches, they'd have to keep fire all the time. If they let the fire go out, they'd come to our house and borry fire. They've come many a time at daylight to borry fire to get breakfast with. They had an old metal bucket, and his two girls, Nodie and Sari, would come after coals. Mama would get them a shovel full and put it in that vessel, and they'd take off running for home. Alex laughed heartily at the memory of those two girls running through the woods with a bucket of coals. Candlelight has been man's chief source of light for over 2,000 years, and when we think of the most primitive form of lighting, candles come to mind. They were usually made of tallow and beeswax, and one would think that this ancient form of lighting would have been, as Alex would say, the go on Newman's Ridge in his time. Here again, Alex had a surprise in store. You hardly ever seen a candle, just a very few people, what you might say the well-to-do, had candles. Most people had to keep what little grease they had to season their food with. They wouldn't ever waste a bit of beef taller, used it to cook with the same way they use pork meat now, and they'd use it to grease their shoes with. The main light way back then was a pine torch. Take the heart of a rich pine and split you out a great bunch of long splinters and tie them together. Sometimes we'd use beef taller and beeswax melted together to make a good candle, but it was just about as bad to smoke as pine. Everything in the house would get as smoked up and black as the chimney jam. Sometimes we'd just put some grease in a little bowl or saucer and twist up a rag and lay it there and it would burn right on. You could use taller, hog lard, polecat grease, or any kind of grease. We didn't have no lamp when I was small. I remember as well as yesterday when Pap went over to Jonesville and brought home a little kerosene lamp. It was just a little tin lamp with a handle on it, and it had a little straight spout. It held about a pint. Didn't have no globe at all. Quite by accident, I discovered a most interesting and dramatic happening in the life of young Alex Stewart. I learned that he had at one time lost his eyesight. A few days before Christmas in 1980, I took my young nephew Rob and my step-grandson Eric to see Alex. We had spent the cold day in the mountains of Upper East Tennessee and in Scott County, Virginia, and it was after dark before we reached Alex's cozy house. We spent an enjoyable two hours there, and Alex gave each of the boys one of his wooden carvings. He had spent many hours on each one, and he had people waiting in line to buy them. But his instinct was to give his visitors something, and the carvings were all he had. During the course of our conversation, I noticed a piece of root lying on the cluttered little table next to where he sat, and I inquired about its purpose. Well, now that's the root of slippery elm, and it's good for all kinds of things. He gave each of us a big chew, and the boys were not at all impressed by its taste. While Alex was preoccupied with his pipe, the boys ridded themselves of the medicine, making all sorts of faces because of its strange and bitter taste. Alex began to tell them of the many uses of the herb, and it was something that would benefit them for the remainder of their lives. 
Realizing they were not too impressed, and in an endeavor to emphasize its medicinal qualities, he said, It brought back my eyesight one time. Were you really blind? As blind as a bat. The measles settled in my eyes and left me blind. I was seven or eight years old, I guess. Me and my sister was going to school in the late fall, and we caught the measles. I took them, and they liked to have never broke out on me. There's a feller by the name of Bob Moore who come along by the house one evening and was carrying whiskey in a gourd. Didn't have no jug or jar, just had it in a big gourd. Well, folks said if whiskey wouldn't break the measles out, nothing else would. So Pap got old man Moore to give me some of that whiskey. I drunk it, and that broke them out. I got up right soon after that, thought I was well, and struck out to work. It was cold, and there was snow on the ground, and I took a back set and went as blind as if I had never had an eye in my head. Pap went and got the doctor for me, old Dr. Mitchell. He come and give me some medicine, and in a few days, he come back to see me. He made about five trips up to see me, and the last trip he said, You're just blind, boy. That's all there is to it. I've done everything I know to do for you, and your eyes is just gone. Well, that very day, old man Goins come. That was Pap's cousin. He was just an old beat, went from house to house for his living. I was sitting with my head down, and he asked what was the matter. Mother told him I was blind. Been that way, she said, for a week. He can't see a thing. My eyes looked like balls of fire. Old man Goins said, Go out and get some slippery elm and put it in his eyes, and if there's anything in the world that will cure him, that will. Well, Pap didn't like him much, and he didn't put any dependence in what he said, but Mother said, Now, Joe, it won't hurt nothing to try. The simplest thing is sometimes the best. Pap didn't believe in it, but he went out and got a little root, and that night Mother made two poultices and bandaged one to each eye, and next morning I could tell my eyes was better. She put poultices on me for three days, and my sight came back. If it hadn't been for that, I'm satisfied. I'd have never seed no more. Since it was the Christmas season, it seemed a good time to ask Alex about how he, as a boy, observed Christmas with his family. I told him I'd return on the following Saturday to discuss this and other subjects. The museum received numerous inquiries from the news media every year about how Christmas was celebrated in Appalachia during earlier times. They all expected, it seemed, to be told of a Norman Rockwell scene where the family members gathered at Grandma's highly decorated house for a sumptuous meal and extensive gift giving. But a more realistic depiction of the Christmas season in many rural areas of southern Appalachia was far less romantic. In 1964, I spent the day before Christmas in an isolated section of Hancock County, going from one old homestead to another in search of relics for the museum. Just before dark, I saw a decorated tree in a modern home, and it occurred to me that this was the first Christmas tree I'd seen during the entire day. In the fertile valleys, almost everyone had a Christmas tree and accompanying decorations, but not here in the mountains. The lack of Christmas celebration was not peculiar to the remote sections of southern Appalachia. The old ways, I think, just lingered much longer here. Harrison E. Salisbury, longtime correspondent for the New York Times, wrote an article for the Reader's Digest in December 1983 about his great-grandfather's brother, Hiram Salisbury, who lived from 1779 until the start of the Civil War in 1861. Salisbury noted that his uncle, in his daily diary, didn't even mention Christmas in his entry for December 25, 1817. Gene Ritchie, the balladeer from the mountain community of Viper, Kentucky, tells about the first Christmas tree her mother, Abigail Hall Ritchie, had. She had read about such things and went out in the forest about 1910 looking for an evergreen. She could find nothing suitable and had to settle for a dormant sourwood. She decorated it with red ribbons, apples, and popcorn. The elder Richie, the mother of 14, said the children liked the tree so well she put one up every year thereafter. 
I knew I could get first-hand information from Alex about the early Christmases. Saturday, my day to visit him was cold. The west wind was blowing and the temperature was dropping towards zero. One of Alex's sons, Lloyd, met me down at the sawmill where I parked. Pap's been looking for you all day long, he said. He finally give you out a little while ago, he said. I guess the weather got a little too rough for John Rice. He'll sure be proud to see you. As usual, he was in his tiny room in the back of the house, and when I entered unannounced, he seemed unusually happy to have company. I just about give you out, he said. Figured you'd froze up. Although his legs had almost completely given way, Alex looked better and seemed to be suffering less than when I had last seen him. He had the chair in which he was sitting leaned against the bed and was trying to finish a cedar walking cane with his pocket knife. He had a good fire going in his grate and plenty of coal and pine kindling beside the fireplace. He gave me a bottle of blackberry brandy which he'd been holding for a long time. He said he felt like talking, so I turned on the tape recorder and away he went for almost two hours. The first Christmas tree I ever knowed of was put up by the Presbyterians who had come in here and built a church house down on Blackwater. I was about ten years old, and nobody had never seen such before. The people just went crazy about it. Miss Axel, one of the Presbyterian missionaries, got me to make her a lot of toys to put on the tree, little pistols and things like that. And oh, the stuff she put on the tree for me for doing that. A knife, a French harp, that liked to have tickled me to death. The children weren't accustomed to getting presents. The first present I ever remember Pap getting us for Christmas was a little candy and an orange. I'll never forget that. I wasn't over four or five years old. I saved that candy and just took a little bite off of it every once in a while. I don't know how long it lasted me. And they didn't have no decorations long back then. That come in later on. On a very few occasions, I had heard references made to old Christmas, but no one, not even those older than Alex, seemed to know anything about it. I asked him if he'd heard of old Christmas, and he responded as follows. Oh yeah, they call it Piffany now. Today, lots of people don't believe in old Christmas by the way they talk. If you don't believe what I'm fixing to tell you, why well, you try it and you'll find out whether it's right or not. On old Christmas night at 12 o'clock, you can go to where there's any cattle and you go and sit down and listen at them pray. I tried that twice. The first time, it liked to have scared me to death. They got to going on so that I broke and run back to the house. But I got to studying about it, and then I tried it again. Me and my oldest sister went together on one old Christmas night. We went to the barn and sat down and waited till about 12 o'clock and just slipped right up easy. Didn't make no racket. We had two milk cows, and directly they commenced just mooing and mooing and groaning and going on, and we got scared and run to the house. Grandpap Stewart told me they do that, but I didn't believe it, and after I tried it twice, I saw they was something to it. And I don't care how cold it is, nor how deep the ground is froze, elder bushes will sprout out of the ground on old Christmas night. They'll sprout out that night and never get no bigger till the sap rises in the spring of the year. If you don't believe me, you find you a place where there's a bunch of elders a growing, and you look around underneath the bushes the night before old Christmas and you won't see any sprouts. Then you go back the next morning and you'll see them sprouts a peeping through the ground everywhere. Don't matter how hard the ground is froze. I've checked that out. I don't know how many times. And don't ever loan anything to anybody if you can help it on old Christmas because you're not apt to get it back. Well, Alex, I don't suppose the children of today know how little their ancestors had. And I guess they don't know how well off they really are. Oh, it's a sight at how much better the little children are clothed and fed today. Yeah, they're in paradise today compared to what they was back then. Alex signs the stock of the crossbow he made for the author based on his memory of the one which belonged to his grandfather. 
This crossbow is now on display at the Museum of Appalachia. Chapter 3, The Pioneer Ancestors If they's ever a good feller that ever lived, Grandpap Stewart was one. Alex knew and liked all his grandparents, and he had a close relationship with his own parents, but it was his grandfather Stewart that had the greatest impact on him. No matter what subject we discussed, Alex would eventually get around to quoting Grandpap Stewart. I asked him once why he spent so much time with his grandfather. Back when I was a very small boy, Pap would go off in the woods to hunt timber or to work in the fields. I was too young to go, and as soon as he'd leave, I'd go to see Grandpap. I'd watch him work and help him a little, and I learned a lot. If he liked you, he'd take the greatest pains in the world to explain anything to you. If he didn't care anything about you, all you could get from him was a yeah, a huh, or a huh. Oh, I've spent lots of nights there. I'd sit and hold a pine torch for him and Grandma to work by many a night. Every once in a while, a big drop of hot tar would drop from that torch onto my hand. Oh, God, it would hurt. Grandma would say, don't touch it, don't touch it. If you'll let it alone, it won't blister. She said that if you took it off, it would blister right away, but if you left it on, the rosin would draw the fire back out. I learned that she was telling the truth. How much education did your grandfather have? He had a pretty good education, but I don't know how much schooling he had. He could read and count all right, enough to take care of himself. Oh, what a handwrite he had. He could write the prettiest handwrite ever I seed. He wrote with a red pen all the time, and wherever he got it, I never did know. Back then, you never seed no red pens. I was there one time when an old Methodist preacher come along selling Bibles, and he said, Mr. Stewart, would you let me borrow a little of your time? The preacher was a one-eyed man. He'd stuck a butcher knife in one of his eyes and put it out. He got him a chair, pulled it up, and sat down, and he had him an old big satchel of some kind, and he reached down in there and got out a Bible. He told Grandpap how great it was and how much better it was than an old-timey Bible. Grandpap had an old-timey Bible. It was that thick, I guess. Alex measured off five or six inches on his hand. Never seen one like it before, nor since, and it had a solid leather back. Grandpap just got up and walked in the house and got it and said, Here's my Bible. Well, the preacher said, Now this one will explain a lot of things that yours don't. Grandpap said, My Bible explains all I want to know about it, and if that's all you want from me, you just as well get up and get gone. I'll never forget that. Every Sunday morning, he'd get up and get that Bible down. He'd sharpen his razor on it and sit down and shave. I never have seen a book like that and of no kind. My daddy got it, and when he died, his second wife got it, and she went crazy and set the house on fire and burned it up. He had all the names and ages of his children in it. If I had that Bible, money wouldn't buy it. Alex knew a little more about his ancestors than most of the people from this region. Typically, many natives of Appalachia know at most that their people came from North Carolina or Virginia. It is most unusual for someone to describe themselves as being of English, German, Welsh, or Scottish descent. This is understandable when one takes into account the constant movement of their ancestors. From the time they landed in one of the American ports, the generations moved westward, each time a little further into the wilderness. Oftentimes, frontiersmen had not even known their grandparents, and it wasn't long before all contact with the past was lost. Add to this the fact that most all their thoughts and efforts were devoted to matters of survival, and one understands why most mountain families knew little about their background. Well, the Stuarts were Irish, and they came from Ireland. The first ones to come to America was Jim Stewart and his brother Sam. Jim was my great-grandfather. They weren't allowed to come on into this country, and they had to hide on the ship in order to get here. I've heard my grandpap tell about them hiding in a big box of ducks on the ship. They hid in that box till they got plumb across the ocean. 
Jim was a captain in the old Revolutionary War. He settled over here, round Jonesville, Virginia. One of Jim's three sons settled close to his daddy, and one, Dan, settled at Pennington Gap. The third one was Boyd, my grandpap. He came over here on Newman's Ridge and saw that boundary of timber, and he bought it for the timber and not for the land. It belonged to the government back then, and I believe he got it for a dollar an acre. It was the best timbered piece of land that I ever looked at. Why, it had sugar maple trees in there that was three or four foot through them, just plenty of them. But they tapped them so much it finally killed them. So your grandfather Stuart was a pioneer in this area. He was one of the first men ever to settle on that ridge. According to our best calculations, Boyd Stewart was born about 1810, and he probably settled on Newman's Ridge in the 1830s as a young man, although most of the wide fertile valleys and the river bottoms were settled a quarter century earlier, Newman's Ridge was doubtless an untamed wilderness at that time. Where was the nearest trading center or the nearest country store? The nearest store was in Jonesville, Virginia, and that was 20 miles away. He'd go off the top of the ridge and walk plumb to Jonesville and back in one day. He had to cross them mountains, Walden's Ridge, Copper Ridge. It's a long way over there. There wasn't no roads back then, just little trails where people could walk. You couldn't get a wagon back up there at all. Forty miles is a long walk across the mountains. Why didn't he ride his horse? I don't know. He was a funny old feller. He told me one time that he left home one morning bright and early to go to Jonesville to get him some coffee. He made chairs and he took four of them to sell, packed them on his back to Jonesville and got him some coffee. He got 50 cent a piece for the chairs. Grandpap was lucky if he could get the money to buy coffee. There's a lot of folks that never had no coffee at all. I've drunk what they called coffee made out of wheat put wheat on the stove and parch it right brown, and it makes pretty good taste in coffee. It is interesting to note the importance of coffee in the life of Boyd Stewart and in the lives of most of his neighbors. When he got money for his chairs, it wasn't sugar, salt, cloth, food, or medicine that he bought, but coffee. All these other items and commodities he could produce himself, but not coffee, at least not genuine coffee. Purchasing a luxury like coffee in a land where food and other essentials were often in short supply seems illogical, but Europe had fallen in love with the beverage in the 1600s, and the habit had followed the immigrants to America. Here it flourished, despite the strict religious teaching of southern Appalachian churches that discouraged its use. Uncle Campbell Sharp, for example, was bragging one day on what a fine Christian woman his wife was, how loyal she had been to him, and what a hard worker she was. Then he paused as if he wasn't sure he should reveal more. She does have one very bad habit, he said dramatically. She has to have her cup of coffee in the mornings. I suppose there were no churches or schools anywhere near Newman's Ridge during those early days. Oh no, Grandpa and Grandma would go over to Jonesville to camp meeting at certain times of the year. They'd stay there several days with one of his brothers. I can remember the first church that was ever built in this part of the country. They built a log church house down here at the foot of the mountain on the side of the road, about three or four miles from where we lived. Didn't have no school, so it was used as a schoolhouse too. I went to school down there many a morning, barefooted, and the ground froze and white with frost. Had to run might near it to keep from freezing to death. Your grandfather spent his life on Newman's Ridge. Yeah, he built a log house and raised his family there. He had ten children, but two got poisoned to death on strychnine. How did that happen? John Overton, an old feller who lived up there, was crippled had the white swelling, and his leg was drawed up this way. Couldn't get it to the ground. Well, he'd hobble through the ridge up there, and he got to drinking the beer off a steel that was run by the Newmans. Some of the boys got to stopping by Newman's steel also, getting them a drink once in a while. 
This old man Newman found out about them drinking his beer, and he went and got some strychnine and put it in a cup and set it on top of the hogshead. That's the barrel where he made his beer. Well, Pap's brother, Edgar, and Dan Creech come through there and stopped at the still. Edgar said, let's wrestle to see who gets the first drink. Well, Uncle Edgar throwed Creech, and he got the first drink, and by the time he got to the house, he didn't know nothing. He didn't live no time till he's dead. Creech, he come so near dying that it took all the hide off his mouth. Then he had a sister, Pap did, that was sickly, and she took a dose of strychnine and killed herself. What happened to the other eight children? Did they stay in the area? No, they all left but two. The oldest one, his name was Whit, he stayed up here on the ridge, and my pap stayed. Whit lived where Ellis Stewart lives now? That's right, Ellis was the son of Whit. Whit lived to be 87 years old. He had 11 children, and Ellis is the only one of them that's still living. They were seven boys, and two of them went to Oklahoma and died out there. Your grandfather was quite a craftsman, wasn't he? He could make anything that could be made out of wood. He made them old spinning wheels, and he made looms to weave on, and he made them little flax wheels. He'd go to the blacksmith shop and make all of his iron, his tools, cranks, spindles, and everything. It takes a good workman to make them flax wheels. He made a flax wheel for a feller once, and the man come to get it, and he's the proudest particular feller you ever saw. He was sort of wanting to court one of Grandpap's sisters, and he was bragging on that wheel. He was wearing a new pair of hand-spun breeches they called jeans. Well, he's a standing there in the yard, and it was pretty sloping under that big apple tree where he stood talking to Grandpap. The chickens had been roosting in that tree and had messed all over the ground. Well, that feller, he stepped in that slick chicken manure on that hillside, and his feet flew out from in under him, and he just got chicken manure all over him. He said, I wish them damn chickens had been shut up in their nests. Grandpap laughed about that. How much would he charge for a spinning wheel? He charged five dollars for a big wheel, the wool wheel. I don't know what he charged for the flax wheel. He get things right before he quit. I've seen him set humped up working on something or other for a week, but time didn't mean anything to him. Why, well, I doubt that he ever kept track of how long it took him to make something like that. He could make the prettiest little wheels of anybody I ever saw. He made one for a feller, Bill Sadler, I believe was his name, and he got me to go with him to deliver it. We started up that mountain, and we went higher and higher and had to rest every once in a while, and Grandpap said, Heavens, heavens, that was his word, heavens. It's a bad to be poor and have to work. I'll never forget that. Your grandfather Stuart was in his prime during the Civil War. Was he involved in that conflict? No, he didn't believe in it, and he wouldn't go. The rebels wanted him to join them, but he never would. He hid out in the mountains in a big sinkhole for about six months. Grandma would slip out in the night and take food to him. Every once in a while, they'd make a big raid for him, but they never caught him. Seven rebel soldiers come looking for him one time, and of course he was gone. They was poking around, and they got in the smokehouse and was carrying off a lot of his meat. Grandma saw them and grabbed them all and beat them with it, and they dropped the meat and left. Did your grandfather have a large house? His house was built long. He had a living room, a kitchen, a dining room, and a smokehouse all attached together right in a row. His porch stretched all the way across, and he had his turning lay on the far end of it. Right above it, he had him a hole bored in a log that he kept grease. Anything that he turned, he'd reach up there and get some grease on his finger and put on his timber, and that made it turn as good again. He'd use hog lard and taller, or either one. And you learned how to make things from your grandfather. Yeah, he'd sit down and take the most pains to explain something to you of any man I ever saw. 
I get out in the fields and woods and hunt pieces of horseshoes that had been lost on the horses, and I'd take them to him, and that would just tickle him to death. He'd take them to his blacksmith shop and make things out of them. He showed me how to heat the iron and temper it and make different things. He always raised a little patch of wheat, enough to make him a little flour so he could have biscuits for breakfast. 95% of the people never had biscuits. They just had cornbread, three meals a day. A lot of people didn't have no bread of any kind, but he had biscuits, and whenever I go there, he'd give me one and put some honey on it. I thought it was the best eaten ever. He was counted to be one of the best fellers around here. People would go to him in the spring of the year to get their seed, taters, corn, beans, and so on to plant. They'd do a little work for him, and he'd let them have some seed, or sometimes he'd give them a little corn to live on till they could raise something of their own. We've all heard about the hunting shirts that Daniel Boone and Davy Crockett wore, but that era seems so remote it lacks the touch of reality. When Alex spoke about hunting shirts, that facet of frontier life took on new meaning. Back then, everybody wore handmade clothes. They had their spinning wheels and their looms, and they'd make their own clothes, and that's all Grandpap ever wore. They didn't have no opening in the front of their shirts. They fastened in the back, but they didn't have no buttons, just little pegs made out of pine. Sometimes they'd make buttons out of a cow's horn. You had to have somebody button them up for you. They didn't have no coats back then, just wore them hunting jackets. I remember the first coat I seen in my life. An old circuit rider had one. He'd make a trip through here every five or six months, going wherever he got the opportunity to preach. He'd come through here with a coat on, and he was the first man ever I seen with one. It was blue, and it come down to his shoe tops. I thought it was the funniest thing. He looked like a woman. Not only did Alex seem to remember everything his grandfather told him, he also remembered the most minute details of every item Boyd Stewart made. For years, I took Alex various wooden relics, antiques, and tools that needed mending. He was always curious about what I'd brought and would come out and peer into the back of the station wagon. On one occasion, I stopped to see his cousin Ellis and found an old rocking chair in the attic of the Stewart home place. Although it had been made by his grandfather, Ellis sold it to me because the bottom was gone and he'd never get around to having another one put in it. Later in the day, when I drove up to the old barn where Alex worked, I saw his faithful dog sleeping in a pile of cedar shavings near the entrance, and I knew Alex was inside. When he recognized me, he smiled broadly, greeting me as he did virtually every time I visited him. Well, I'm sure proud to see you. I was just a studying about you a while ago. He took a twist of his homegrown tobacco from the bib pocket of his overall, and with his pocket knife, shaved off a palmful. He did so as we walked toward the station wagon. He peeped through the glass, using one gnarled hand to shade his eyes from the glare. Then, with an air of excitement, he said, John Rice, where'd you get that rocking chair? That's one of Grandpap Stewart's chairs. The southern mountains are filled with chairs of similar design, and I was amazed that he could distinguish this one from all the others. I said in what I hoped was a convincing manner, Why, Alex, I bought that old chair down in Georgia. It couldn't have been made by your grandfather. But his confidence wasn't shaken in the least. His response was quick, almost snappy. I don't care if you bought it in China. I know my grandpap's chair when I see it. Indeed, he did. When I confirmed he was right, he laughed heartily. You didn't have to tell me. I knowed it was one of Grandpap's chairs the minute I laid eyes on it. I've bought them enough chairs. If they'd lined up in a row, they'd stretch from here plumb down to Knoxville. I've told everybody that I've bought them my last one. I ain't able to roam the mountains and ridges getting the bark and packing it home on my back anymore. I don't know what the folks that's wanted me to bottom their chairs, and I've turned them all down. But I'll tell you what I'm going to do. You put that chair out here, and I'll put you a hickory bottom in it that'll be there long after you and me are both gone. Well, I did just that, and when I returned a few days later, the old rocker had a sturdy and attractive bottom woven from strips of inner hickory bark. I'm sure that Alex took special care in bottoming this chair and that he felt a communion with his grandfather as he worked with it, knowing it had been fashioned by the elder craftsman 
This bottom has seen almost 20 years of daily use and shows no sign of wear. It should last at least another 50 years and Alex's prediction will have been right. So fascinating part of um, Alex's life that we got to read about today. Thankfully, there was none of the gruesomeness of the chapter before. Maybe a little touch there, but not much, not compared to the, the heartache of those uh, children that we read about in the previous chapter. But how fascinating. I'm fascinated by using the bark on the uh, roofs of the roofing of the houses. How fascinating and that he I'm so glad that John Rice documented that that he had you know He was here. It is in this book, but that he was um, You know that he was able to get that information from Alex before it was lost for good Amazing part about his eyes about him going blind from having measles uh, and slippery elm I've never used slippery elm, but I've heard that or read it in lots of like medicinal books and different things like old accounts that I've read so that is fascinating and amazing that um, that it healed his eyes that he the way he describes them about being red and uh, irritated makes you wonder if it was like if they were almost like infected to the point that he couldn't see I don't know but anyway whatever ever what the cause was it's amazing that slippery elm actually cured it this chapter, uh, well, kind of the two parts of two chapters that I read, really gives an insight into his grandfather, Stuart, his grandpap. I love that name, grandpap. Uh, so that's really fascinating. He sounds like such a knowledgeable man that knew how to do anything. And I love the, the part about him walking to Jonesville with the chairs on his back. People were, I mean, because they had to be, you know, we think those people that lived in those, these times were such tougher people. Even in my dad's lifetime, in pa my pap's lifetime, uh, when he was a small kid, just people were just different. You think of them as being so much tougher than we are today, but they had to be. They didn't have no choice. They had to be. Um, and I like, along with that walk, that he went after coffee. And then John Rice kind of goes into detail about how it, coffee is so well-loved. And by no means is it only well-loved in Appalachia. Coffee's well-loved all over the world. But I, I really like that part because I've known so many coffee drinkers that really adored their coffee. Uh, and would probably pick it over the sugar and the other things that he mentioned that you could trade for. Pap was a huge coffee drinker. He drank coffee all through the day. He drank it with his meals. Of course, he drank it in the morning. He took a thermos of it with him uh, when, he, when he left for the day if he was going somewhere. Matt does the same thing. Matt's a big coffee drinker. He doesn't always drink it with his meals, but he takes a, a thermos of coffee with him to work every morning. So I, I liked that part. And then it was interesting when he talked about um, some of the people would make their coffee from wheat. Well, if you watch my other videos a lot, you'll, you've will you probably heard me or seen on my counter or something, Postum. So Postum is made from wheat, and that's what I drink now. I can't, because of health issues, I can no longer drink coffee. I used to love coffee, not to the uh, point that Pap did. I was a morning coffee drinker. I would drink it in the morning, and that's all. But, uh, but that was interesting, so they were roasting the wheat there, parching the wheat, he called it, which is kind of like roasting it on top of the stove eye uh, to, to make coffee out of it, but that's really what Postum is made from. One other part that I liked when he was talking about the grandpap was how he, he was talking about John Rice had asked about his schooling, and he's talking about, you know, he wasn't sure, but he could read and, and knew his numbers, you know, he could do math and all that kind of stuff, but he said he had the prettiest handwrite. I love that word, handwrite. Uh, I don't say that, and I don't hear anybody that says that, but it's in my Dictionary of Smoky Mountain English and in a lot of my other reference books that that was how people used to refer to one's handwriting was to say handwrite, that he has a good handwrite or he doesn't have a good handwrite. Um, one of my favorite old songs, like a traditional ballad that Corey and Katie sing, The Blackest Crow, it has a line in it about handwrite. I will link to that down below so that you can hear it. It's a beautiful song. But then you'll hear that verse um, or that line that really just will really tug at your, uh, at your heartstrings. So I really liked that part. But I hope that you'll tell me what you liked about what I read today, what jumped out at you, what you thought was curious or interesting. And as always, I hope you drop back by because we've got to find out now what happens to Alex Stewart next or find out more about his life. It's not really going in chronological or order as much um, as maybe Dory, Woman of the Mountains, did because John Rice is asking these questions that makes uh, Alex you know, remember back to maybe he was just four or five years old or maybe he was 10 or maybe he was a grown adult. So it's kind of switches back and forth, but it's still very fascinating.